So my name's Kasim Javed. I'm a, a rheumatologist, and I deal with adult patients with rare diseases. And as Paul mentioned, I'll discuss the RUDI study. That's what the acronym stands for, but actually I get asked this a lot. It was the patients who chose the acronym, and we had to fit the words to make it work, because it had to work for patients both in adulthood and also in childhood. So it's nothing scientific. Um, so I'll talk about what a rare disease is, building on what's already been said, examples of rare diseases of the skeleton, and then really focus on why the research is needed and the role the universities played in this in partnership with the BRC, BRU and the Hospitals Trust. So as already said, rare diseases defined in Europe is when there's one case per 2,000. Um, and that's about 0.1% of the UK population will have uh, one rare disease. But that's the upper limit. Most of the diseases are one in 10,000 or <coughs> even fewer. And you can compare this with diabetes, which is 1 in 16. So these are rare or ultra-rare conditions. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of rare diseases. Um, every few years, the world gets together and they make this booklet of diseases. There's 436 bone disorders across 42 groups and 364 genes. So it's a massive exercise. But as has already been mentioned, most of these diseases, we haven't worked out the molecular diagnosis in every subtype. <coughs> the one, I'm, one of the ones I'm interested in is a disease called fibrous dysplasia mucuna albright, and it shares many of the problems with any of the other skeletal diseases, such as osteogenesis imperfecta <coughs> and extant hyperphosphatemia. So people are bored with an overactivity of the bone and hormone tissues. They develop bone cysts that can be painful, you can fracture through them, your bones can be deformed, they can cause quite severe compression of nerves, and very rarely they can change to cancer. So what does that look like? Um, so this is a normal x-ray of someone's pelvis. <coughs> you can see the pelvic bone there. Chairman, do you want a glass of water? <laughs> you can share, this yeah, has got my germs in, you can yeah, share no, that. No, it's it's <laughs> not not oh, it's, oh, sorry, no, no, I didn't have to get up. So if you can see the spine there, and then you can see the, the hips on the side. That's a normal one. And you can immediately see this is someone who's affected with fibrous dysplasia. S holes, cysts, lots of lesions in, in, the, in the femur, causing deformity. The shape of the hip bone is different. If, if one has a look, um, pull the cursor. So the shape of the hip bone is different here compared to on the other side. That doesn't hurt. Okay, that doesn't hurt. You can get it just in the big toe. So you can see in the big toe, there's a little cyst. Just there. That's enough to stop him working. Okay, so we don't understand. The image doesn't tell the story of what the patient feels. And that's one of the things we're working on. So why do we need research? Well, if you really want to know, this is a fantastic document that Alistair Kent put together from the Genetic Alliance, and it's called the UK Strategy for Rare Diseases, written in very simple language, and goes through bit by bit what we need to do for patients with rare diseases. It's available free on the internet. You can download it from the department website, although it would say it was written during the coalition times, <laughs> whereas that's no longer the case. But really, it's what most patients want. They want a correct diagnosis, right test, shortest time from the start of symptoms to getting the diagnosis, and it's a certainly the right one. Don't want misdiagnoses or the wrong diagnoses. They want the best treatment. They want to get what we know works. They want to avoid treatments and tests we know are not helpful or may be harmful. And what might work, they want to be properly tested so people can learn from their responses. And they want the best information for them as patients, for their family and carers, but also for their employers, and for their future. So let's take on best information. The NHS has poured millions into providing information resources for patients. This is a disease called osteoporosis. You may have heard of it. It's the commonest bone disorder we have. There's lots of information here on symptoms, causes, diagnosis, treatment. There's even a little video, someone talking about osteoporosis. There's lots of information. This is what you get if you put in fibrous dysplasia which happens to be one of our commoner rare diseases. There's absolutely no information there. And this is quite a challenge when people get diagnosed for the first time. They put the search term in, and there's nothing on the NHS website. And we, we run a very patient, the people, part of Rudy here, why don't you put your hands up, 
but we run a very patient-focused organisation within Rudy, and we have forums for Skypes every eight weeks with the patients. And uh, we asked them, the first Skype, what's the main problem? They said, Dr. Javed, it's really frustrating when we're going to the doctor and he hasn't had my complete record. Either when I go from paediatrics to adults, a child to adult care, go to different hospitals or even different departments in the same hospital, they always ask me to tell my story again, <laughs> as if it's going to change every time I tell it. Mm -hmm. I want a patient diary. I don't want to have to keep telling the same information. Let's write it down once and make it available for all the team. Mm -hmm. There's lots of bad data on the internet. We need to be able to flag up what's true and evidence-based so someone who's newly diagnosed doesn't get unduly anxious. And Dr. Javid, it's really interesting. When I go to patient groups where I meet patients from different hospitals, they're all having different treatments. I have yet to meet someone who, with the same disease I have, same severity, with the same treatment as me. And we know that's because we're not sharing what we're doing. Every hospital is doing something slightly different. And because the patients are so infrequent, there's not enough patients together in one hospital to say, yeah, that, that really isn't working, or that is working. There's still few, too few patients in each centre. And that means there's poor learning between hospitals. So what about diagnosis? So if you've got a, a diagnosis is key to accessing everything. So if it hurts to walk, you see a doctor, does an assessment, does some tests, maybe diagnoses osteoarthritis, treatment program, there's something they can do. If you've got a rare disease, actually at the tests, you either get no diagnosis or more concerningly, the wrong diagnosis. And that leads to uncertainty, wrong tests, wrong therapies, and a real delay to correct diagnosis. And this can take decades. So a quarter of patients wait up to 30 years to get a diagnosis. So I'm still diagnosing patients who I've seen as adults who present as children. And they've been labelled with one disorder, doesn't seem to be quite behaving normally. They send them to me saying, is this a rare variant? And we say, actually, no, it's the wrong diagnosis. They've actually got this. They've got fibrous dysplasia or they've got cherubism, not fibrous dysplasia. It's still happening. And 30 years I had a bit of fun is a long time. That's 1986 if I diagnose them today. That's when they signed the contract to start thinking of building the Channel Tunnel. That's how long 30 years is. When those two got engaged, and when Oxford won the cup. So it's a long time ago. <laughs> and that's how long patients are waiting. So what about treatment? We had a masterclass, and I'm not going to read out these comments, but please read them yourselves. This is what the patients are experiencing in the NHS at the moment. Not in Oxford, and I'm not saying Oxford's different from anywhere else, there may be patients in Oxford experience this, but they have uh, either the, the clinicians don't recognise that these rare disorders can be related to their condition. They think, oh, it's some uh, what we call incidental finding, it's not important. Or they do the opposite, get so excited, they want to read all about it and become real expert in it. But for the patient, they want to see a doctor who's seen it before at least once and not be the guinea pig. And I think what's happening now, the NHS has realised that because actually the patient in the bottom one was very upset because she actually had to leave her GP to get referred somewhere else because the local consultant wouldn't refer her on. So we have to do better. We have to do better with research, with clinical care, if we're going to improve these patient outcomes. And a lady called Sally Davis, who's one of our bosses right up there at the NIHI main research organisation of the government, said, look, this is a great system in the UK. Pretty much everyone is in the NHS. So if you've got something wrong with you, we can track you through the NHS. Not like America, where everyone has private insurance or anything like that. There is one system. So she said, look, let's set up a, a pathway where we can turn the NHS into a laboratory and really study these rare disease patients in more detail. And that's what was mentioned earlier. They love acronyms, so this is the RDTRC. And I'd like to thank Claire, who's from the RDTRC, who's actually put this event together. And there are 14 themes, it's very difficult, so they go from skin, uh, problems with the immune system, problem with muscles, and then the skeleton, which I lead with Professor Wordsworth and Rashid Lukmani, looking at musculoskeletal disorders. But you can see that Professor Watkins in cardiology is represented, um, and also Professor Roberts, who looks after non-malignant blood disorders, also in Oxford, is represented. Because researching rare disease patients is hard, because by definition, they ain't all in your hospital. They're everywhere in the UK, and you'll never have enough coming to your centre uh, to really track them as, as you'd want. And that poses its own problems, because often patients are only offered research that's going on in their institution. 
So Oxford patients will often only get offered Oxford research and London patients only get offered London research because the, the consultants are keen to recruit them into studies that they're interested in to see how uh, certain treatments or tests may work. But if you go to the patients, they don't want that. They want to know all the research that's available so they can choose. Actually, I like the one in Glasgow. That sounds quite interesting. Let me take part in that one. Or I like the one in Liverpool. And then there's the other thing. We're dealing in an environment which is getting so busy and so economically constrained. If we're going to research rare disease patients, it's got to be low cost. It has to be low work for doctors. Most doctors are flat out, 100% clinical. But really, to get them to spend half an hour or 15 minutes to fill in extra forms and looking at, look at extra tests may be too much. It's got to be easy for patients to uh, engage with. Often having a rare disease is a full-time job. You may have mobility issues, you may have to see different consultants, different hospitals, it becomes a full-time job. And then if your children are affected, that makes it, e you've got two full-time jobs. And it's got to work. So let's go through how you can do research in diseases. This is the traditional model. You come to a hospital, someone finds you, gives you a piece of paper to read that's got information about the study. So who here has taken part in a research study? Who here has had to look at a piece of paper? Keep your hand up. Piece of paper to get it going. Okay, I'll come back. And then you, make, you read that information, and then you sign a piece of paper saying you'll take part, and they give it back to you. I don't know where you put it. Do you put it on the... <laughs> can you find it now? Probably not. And then... Oh, <laughs> excellent. You probably... Could. And then we have to store that paper, and then you scribble in, in questionnaires by hand on pieces of paper, and that gets posted to you and posted back, or maybe at the, cl uh, the clinic. And then the researcher has to put it onto a computer, and then we have to check they put on the computer right. And then finally, we have research-ready data. Kind of long-winded. What we used to do before we had computers. The other way is to look at routine medical data. So we have an electronic system. So all the G about 8% of GPs are now linked up. Uh, we've got 6 million people whose data we can access. And we can anonymously, anonymously look at their outcomes. If you've got heart disease and diabetes, what happens after five years? There are some, some consent issues, we get the data, but the problem with that routine data, it's not collected for research. So if you want to know if back pain makes heart pain worse, it's impossible, because some GPs may ask about back pain, other GPs may not. So you may not have the right information. So we took the bold step. We said, this is ridiculous. Most of the stuff we're interested in is how patients feel. Why can't they enter the data directly into the database? They log in, and write down how they're feeling, not on a piece of paper, but directly into the database that then goes straight to the researcher. Because if the patient can't tell you what's wrong with them, uh, someone interpreting probably won't do any better. And a lot of our peers said, ooh, that's a bit dangerous, you know, patients are involved, what's the quality of the data like, how are you going to know what they're saying is truthful? And we said, well, that's, that's possibly true, and we're doing some work to test that, but so far, the quality of the data is higher than what we get from the medical records. You've all had clinic letters that have had errors in, wrong dosages, wrong drugs. It happens all the time. And actually, the patients really care what goes into the patient record because it's their patient diary. Um, and because it's their patient diary, they want to make sure it is. There may be true, justified misinterpretations, but they want to make sure the data that goes in there is quality from their perspective. Then it's really easy to get patients. You don't have to give them a piece of paper, get them to sign stuff. You just ask them, Go to the website, go to rudystudy.org, and it will all be there. All the information needs to be there. And it cuts down that huge effort to try and recruit patients to a simple phrase, check out the Rudy Study website. And then you engage with patient groups who have been fantastic. So the Brittle Bone Society, the XLH Network, <coughs> the Fibre Display Society, Vasculitis UK, we're on Google, Facebook, and Twitter, all pushing patients to the Rudy Study and automatically, any patient can now access Rudy from anywhere in the UK and even internationally. So now I'd like to give you a quick demonstration of Rudy. They, they never do live demonstrations, but uh, let's give it a go. So this is the actual Rudy study website, uh, which you can look on your phone now. It's available now. This is the live website. Um, it says what it is, which diseases we're interested in at the moment, well, wow, it's only 397 last week. So this is how many people are recruited live. And these almost 3,000 questionnaires are completed. And this just happens. 
It just happens. People find it, they sign up. Alison at the back is the, the project manager and sh does the consent calls and soon we'll be hopefully going to consentless, uh, telephoneless consent where people just recruit online. But these numbers just go up. What will I have to do? Who are we? Who funds us? And then all the charities we deal with. So, for example, we click on Hard Display Support Society. This is their website. It's a really good website. And here, here we are, Call for Action. And it links to us. So we promote charities. They promote us. If you want more information or what will I have to do, you just click on the more information tab <coughs> and here's the registration form which we've got downstairs. And everything you need to know about the study is online. No pieces of paper, you can look at it on your phone, you can look at it on your tablet uh, and then this is the consent form you may be asked to sign. So you can look at all that information, if you lose it, it doesn't matter, it's all available online. And then if you think, actually I'm interested in this study, let's take part, we've tried to make it as simple as possible. So, have you read the patient information sheet? There's a link to that if you haven't. I have. I have the rare disease. We also do, because of the patient forum, we also include family members. Because they said, actually, I've got the rare disease, but my husband is the one who has to drive me to all the appointments and look after me. So, we've got that as well. Who you are. Uh, date of birth. I don't know what his real date of birth, well, his fictional date of birth is. Uh, postcode. Uh, where did you hear about Rudy? Maybe I just went on a web search. Uh, an email address. So maybe in and a password. And then that creates the account. And it looks quite easy because the person who designed this is actually an animator. And now he's a web programmer, so he's made it look really beautiful and it works on all devices. So he says, welcome Sherlock, tell us about your diagnosis. At the moment we only have bone and blood disorders, so we can put most of the bone disorders here. So let's put in fibrous dysplasia. And then if you've got something else, we have something else. Um, so Marfan's. I, I can't read from here. Oops. And the next thing is your phone number. And then when do you want to be called? Uh, let's pick, this is the next two weeks, so you just pick times you want to be called. Uh, and then maybe you want to say, you know, try Tuesday. Uh, and then it says thank you. And what's happened now, that email has now gone back to Rudy, um, to Alison, then sets up a workflow for Sherlock, and will email him of which of these times Sherlock wants to be contacted. Uh, and then that will happen. And then what will happen is that um, sorry, trying to do. Um, uh, the patient will be contacted by phone. Um, they'll have a phone call. They'll be offered consent. If they're happy to have consent, they'll say, yeah, I'm happy to take part in Rudy. With an email on the consent form, they sign it either by paper and post it back or paper, take a photo and send it back to us. And then the Secure Rudy website, which looks like this. Uh, and this is their own private website. No one else can access this. This is the test website. Only they can access it and the senior administrators can. This is all their private data. And it's in a number of tabs here. And if people who are in Rudy want to talk about it, please feel free, it's up to you. But there's a to-do page, a profile page, and a timeline page. But basically, we've, we've asked really simple questions like, what's your quality of life? I'm using the simple question is, because we don't even know what the quality of life is for patients with rare diseases. There's not a single paper in uh, one of the rare diseases, XLH and the quality of life. Mm -hmm. We actually don't know what it's like to live with these diseases. We measure pain loads of different ways, because I've sort of got an ex expertise in pain. We use two types of questionnaires for that. Activity of daily living, um, that's a childhood pain questionnaire. Um, and then sleep, that came from the patient group. They said, hang on, my sleep is terrible. Why are you not asking about it? So we put it on for them. And then anxiety and depression uh, and uh, fatigue was another really important one. So let's pick, um, I don't know, uh, let's pick this one. Not to activities of daily living. This is a questionnaire, and basically it's very easy to complete. So you say, uh, 
uh, how easy it can you take t drinks from one room to another, not at all with help, with difficulty, or on your own. And basically, you just tab as you go through it. So you can see it's really quite straightforward to do, and you can change your mind. Uh, you can get bored, save, and then come back to another time if you want to. But then when you finish it, it goes from um, uh, uh, blue, which is not started, to orange started, and then green done. We've done that with lots of questionnaires, and our questionnaire return rate is quite high. Another cool feature we put is the timeline. So this is really answering the patient diary. And a lot of my patients fill this in. They find it really helpful. Uh, basically, you can add events. So at the moment, we've got fractures as, as an event. So you can put, um, what were you doing when you fractured? So maybe you were listening to a lecture. Uh, <laughs> hopefully not today. Let's put it in a few years ago. 2009, you've forgotten the day and the month. Uh, maybe you fell from standing. And then you put in which bone you broke. So we've got a really nice uh, skeleton. You can whiz it round. You can click on the bones that you broke. If you're medical, you know which part of the bone you broke, you can put that in. But you can see, you can very quickly put in uh, fractures. And then what we're really interested in is what happened when you fractured. Did you go to a hospital? And then you can put any hospital in. So if you put in Leicester, I can't spell at the moment. Let's put London in. <laughs> uh, Charing Cross Hospital, that's where I trained. There you go. So Charing Cross, and you're in there for four days. Why is that important? I know when you fractured. I know where Charing Cross Hospital is. I can go to Charing Cross Hospital and get your records and confirm the diagnosis. Okay? I can even get the x-rays across if I wanted to do or look at the how, hot, how expensive it was for you to be there. And I can save that admission. Did you have any surgery performed? Just say yes, because that means we'll look for operations. Did you have outpatients? That adds cost to see your GP. Any medications? We've actually added the entire BNF onto the database, and it's updated every six months. We've even got very rare drugs. So you can put any drug you want in there. And that's really important when you think that steroids are important, are different <coughs> bone drugs important. We treat it at home. Some people actually treat fractures at home because they have so many. Then physiotherapy, because the patient group wanted it. You know, I had community physio. Uh, did I <laughs> you'll only ever get six sessions, I'm afraid, on the NHS. <laughs> so that's all you get. Uh, and that's there. And then we've got the next one, which is recovery. So overall, how well did you recover? I reckon I got to, I don't know, 70%. And it took me 12 weeks. And what were you like when you fractured? Did you need a, s a frame? So maybe you needed a frame for a month. And now you have to use a walking stick or a crutch. And did you have any complications? I didn't have any complications, I remember. That's it done. So now if we look at the thing, when was it 2000? It was when I was listening to a lecture. That's why I was shopping while in Edinburgh. There you go. And that was the other one. There, this is, this is the one, listening to a lecture. Charing Cross, <laughs> it's all in there. And if you click on any of these, you can change it very quickly. But you can see that interaction we have with the doctor telling me what your history is, is now completely transformed. It's now available online. You can actually scroll it. If you want, you can print it as a PDF. And we're adding new things. We're adding your diagnostic history. So when did you first have symptoms? When did you first go to the GP? When did you first see any hospital doctor? What other diagnoses were you given? And where and when did you get the right diagnosis? So that's all in there. We're adding operations, transplants, and other diagnoses. So really building up the timeline to be something quite significant. And we think that's going to really help people when they come to uh, get engaged and hopefully promote them getting more involved in the Rudy study. So that's a timeline. So why should the patients take part? Well, it's, we've made it easy for the patients. Hopefully people who've taken part find it quite easy because you can put a lot in or a little in. It, it's really up to you. But is it effective? So the patient forum is actually an integral part of Rudy. We have all these governance committees on the database for the oversight committee who can look at the data, the external advisory committee, the policy group. They all have representatives from the patients and they have a powerful voice. We engage with all these patient groups we make sure it's as secure as possible. So the actual, although it's uh, uh, on the web, the actual database is in the University of Oxford. So they basically have to hack the University of Oxford to get access to your data, and we make sure they're on two separate servers. So your data that's private is on one server, and your research data is on another server to keep it even safer. And you can get your disease diary back. 
but it goes way beyond that. So we have these Skypes I mentioned. Every six to eight weeks, Alison listens in. It's 8.30 in the, after, in the evening, because that's when most people can do it. Uh, we don't do it during working hours, because most people with rare diseases are, are busy during the day. Um, they chose the name and the logo. They added in research questions, so sleep, part, e health economics, and effects on partner. They encouraged us to go onto Facebook and Twitter. They've told us how to improve recruitment by completely changing how Rudy runs, so to the extent we had to almost reapply for a new study. Uh, they review all the new features, uh, and it really makes them feel empowered, and we have about 15 people, and about four to seven go on the Skype every eight weeks. Some people all the time, some people rotate. But another thing we have with patient groups, we're very lucky in Oxford, we've got access to really clever people. And this is Professor Jane Kay, and she's a lawyer. Um, and she's the best lawyer I've ever met, actually. Uh, so she said, basically, you have this process called informed consent, where you've got the information, you understand it, and you're freely agree to take part. There's no coercion, it's up to you. Jane asked two questions. Is that decision fixed over time? Just because I agree today to take part in the study, I may not agree to take part in all bits of it a year later or two years later. My only option is to get out of the study. It seems a bit of a waste if there's only one bit I don't want to take part in. And what's in it for me? So we've addressed these directly within the Rudy study. So if we go to the profile page, um, this gives some information about the study. And here are the consent options. So that piece of consent paper that you didn't know where you put is irrelevant now. It's on your website anytime, and it's live. And as you can see, there are these green ticks and these red crosses. And you can change how much you take part in the study. So say if you actually say, actually, I don't want any to take part in the genetic stuff. I've just read in the mail, these doctors are going to make mice out of my genes. I don't want to. You can say that. I don't want industry to be involved in my uh, using my... I don't want my samples going toward drug companies because I think they're really bad. Or you can say, I don't mind who has my samples. Just get me the tests and the treatments that are going to cure my disease. And you can adapt how deeply you take part in the study very easily and dynamically. You agree how your samples are used, so excess tissue. We talked about genetics, and there's hyperlinks here to explain genetic research. Um, Substudies, so you may want to take part in uh, a, a substudy <coughs> for appointments, for bone density scans, for blood tests. How your data is looked at is also <coughs> looked into. And then contact. How should we contact you to remind you to have the questionnaires every six months? Actually, just send me a text message or actually just send me an email. And what about the progress of the study? Well, you can email me every quarter. Well, actually, I'll just go to the website. Don't worry about emailing me. <coughs> and this is a really key one. The power of Rudy, and if we've already tested some one thing, is we'll have lots of patients with rare diseases who can enter research. So we can now get investigators coming to us saying, I'm studying this disease. I've only got three people in my hospital. Do you have any of those people? And they say here, I agree to be contacted about future ethically approved studies I may be eligible for. Uh, you decide how you want to be contacted. And immediately, the UK then becomes a proper laboratory for research into rare diseases because we can not only identify patients, but through, say, the fracture timeline or the drugs they're on, we can even say, yeah, we've got 100 patients with this. Half of them are on this drug. Uh, you don't want those. You want the people who aren't on any drug. Well, these are the half that are we've got about 30, 40, or 50 of those patients. So we can really help trialists, whether they're uh, from uh, universities or drug companies, get a handle of how likely they are to recruit into drugs. So that's dynamic consent. But this is the other thing. I had a lady in clinic who came to me about four months ago, and her son has got a really rare disorder. It was so rare, I had to look it up <laughs> before he came. I'd never heard of it. But it was, it's been diagnosed about five years. You know the gene and everything. She hadn't been in touch with anyone for ages. She, her son helped find the gene. She didn't know the gene had been found um, because they never got back to her. And that can't really happen. It's not really fair on the participants. So we now have any time any paper comes out of any data that, that you've submitted, a summary of it is put on your website. So you immediately know how your, uh, your questionnaires, all that work you're putting into is helping put research forward. So this is real, so this is the paper we've just submitted, and I'll talk about the results a bit later, showing how what we're doing within Rudy and working with the patients is really pushing things forward. 
Oh, success of the process. That's why I put those things in. So let's just go to... So has it worked? Let's show you if it's worked. Ah, morning in. Oh, it's taking, there you go. So this is if it's worked or not. This is our accrual rate. So we started in uh, spring of April 2014, a slow start because we were just getting ready, but we're already up to f over 400 with a really small team. It's amazing. We're recruiting rare disease patients across the UK with a skeleton team. And you can see every time I do a talk, <laughs> you suddenly get a hit <laughs> when I do the talks. But you know, we're hoping that it will just keep going up and up and up. And we don't know if it's going to go uh, really high or if it's just going to plateau out. But at the moment, it's quite good. With the scale of our team, that's enough. Where are the patients? Well, we can tell you this. So we've got 70 fibrous dysplasia patients. These are the different types of brittle bone disease we have. This is XLH. We work very closely with Vasculitis UK, and these are the Vasculitis patients. But a lot of patients are in the other group, where there's one of. So pregnancy-associated osteoporosis, we've got some patients. Patients with very funny avascular necrosis of, of their femurs after certain treatments, we've got them. So we've got lots of other patients as well. And indeed, there was a researcher from Edinburgh who needed blood from someone who's got this. Some children are born with a very rare, devastating disease where they just get premature calcification of their blood vessels. So they've got the blood vessels of a 60-year-old at the age of six months. Very rare condition. Needed blood. One patient in southeast uh, London. Through Rudy, we could link the two together and offer them the research. So it's a really powerful tool. And this tells you the questionnaires we're completing. So I, from I can tell immediately what proportion of the questionnaires at baseline, six months, 12 months, and now 18 months are being completed. So we can get a heads up to see if there's any problem with patients not completing questionnaires. So it's worked. So how well have we done? Well, on the back of this, because I've got now this sort of head of steam for rare diseases, <coughs> we're working with the James Lind Alliance, uh, and this is a process by which we send surveys to patients with diseases to work out the priorities for research. And we picked adults with these three diseases, X-linked hyperphosphatemia, brittle bone or osteogenital effector, and <coughs> fibrous dysplasia. And if you've got those conditions, those questionnaires will be coming to you for you to complete the survey. Really exciting thing we did is um, we worked very closely with the patient groups that I mentioned, and they were bringing over an American for one day to talk to them about their disease. And he's a really nice guy, Michael Collins, big NIH. He spent his lifetime studying uh, fibrosplasia. And we said, look, if you bring him over for the patient day, we'll pay for him to stay for two more days and make it into a masterclass. So with the patient masterclass, which was an amazing event, with 70 patients and family members in the room, listening to Michael, Alison, and myself talk about the management of fibrous dysplasia. You know, and this is, this is the youngest, everyone came, and this is Michael engaging with the people. It was a really low-key, no pretension, people asked questions. We had workshops till 8 o'clock in the evening, where Michael would take patients one by one and go through their issues. Because he's seen everything from the States. The next day was really interesting. We, we have often have research meetings to prioritise, but eight patients stayed. We paid for them to stay in bread and breakfast or supplemented their, their fees so they could stay. And we had a, uh, in the morning we did talks on bone pain, health economics and research priorities. Uh, and it was international. And this is very interesting, so just a flavour. So we asked them before they came in, what do you want to study? Diagnosis, treatment or long-term management? Everyone said treatment, but look at that. The patients really wanted diagnosis. The medics thought, we don't need to do diagnosis, it's done. Because they'd already seen the patients who were diagnosed. They never saw the ones who hadn't been diagnosed yet. This really emphasises the need to get it across. And we agreed, we don't know why it hurts, we don't know why bone pain happens in fibrous dysplasia, and we've agreed to set up an international cohort study. And on the final day, we did something really challenging. We got seven countries to agree in one way to treat the condition. From diagnosis to staging to treatment with drugs, down to the dose and the frequency. Very challenging. We're still fighting, literally, <laughs> over what dose to use. But when we agree, that'll be the patient pathway, and the Americans are going to put it into Wikipedia and lock the page. 
So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can go to that Wikipedia page and you can see what the Fibre Space Support Society recommends as standard ca of care for this rare disease. And that will really revolutionise care across the world. Finally, we will need to know how well a new drug works. If I get a new, there's a new drug coming out, some drugs are £20,000 a month. So just that's a quarter of a million a year. That's a lot of money. So we've got to make sure it works. So how do we know it works? Well, we can measure pain, mobility, but the common one we use is quality of life. And this is used by the NHS to say, is it worth it? Is the improvement in quality of life worth it for the NHS for the price we have to pay? Uh, some of our work, so the abstract I showed you is looking at that. So we did some work in patients with OI, which is brittle bone disease. FD is fibrous dysplasia, and XLH is excellent hyperphosphatemia, using a standardised questionnaire looking at pain other than anxiety and depression. Blue means no problems. Anything red or green means moderate or severe. The first thing you see for pain, pretty much similar. 30 to 40% had moderate or worse pain. Kind of expected that. We didn't expect this. For some reason, patients with Exolate, and there are some in the room maybe, they're not annoyed by it. They don't get anxious, they don't get depressed. And we think it's because they've had it all their life, or something else has happened. But their rates of anxiety uh, and depression were way lower than people with FD or with brittle bone disease, which is really interesting. Because when you look at their pain, it's the same. And this is the problem, because that then means they score better than other patients, even though they've got the same pain. And that may influence how expensive drugs can be to use their, for their treatment. And we're now talking with drug companies, because it may well be the measures that we use in other diseases don't work in certain rare diseases. And we have to be really careful, because NICE, that lovely organisation, uses that score for deciding what drugs get in. And if that score doesn't work in XLH, we have to tell them right away, actually, just use the pain score, the anxiety and depression score, we don't know what's going on. So what we're doing for Rudy? As you can see, I'm a massive fan of Rudy. I think it's fantastic. The patients love it. It works really well. We're trying to get into the rare bone disease theme for the next round of the BRC, and I think we've got it. Working with Andy Carr with that. I personally see it as a standard patient platform. We've already used taxpayer money to build it. It's NIHR money which comes from taxes. So there's no reason for anyone else to build a patient platform. It's available on a free academic license. Any academic unit can use it. You can put the patients in in the UK and it just, just happens. All you have to pay for is for the consent. So rather than you paid for someone to build it, just use Rudy. If Rudy doesn't work for you, th then use something else. But we're thinking bigger than that. So I'm going to Malaga to present to the Europeans and we wanted to use it for all rare bone diseases across the European reference network, <laughs> which is a big ask because a lot of centres have their own type. But also all rare diseases. So working with Jane, we went to Japan. I took my programmer, Joe Barrett, who's the programmer who built this beautiful database, and we've translated Rudy into Japanese. Because the Japanese saw this, and they said, well, why do we want to rebuild it? We'll just use your one. Can you change the text to Japanese? And we said, we have no idea. Give us some money, and we'll find out. And we can. So now it's gone in now, and I think on the 1st of April, they start using it in Japan for rare, rare neurological disorders, because uh, that's what they're interested in but they want to use Rudy Japan, and it would be on the website as Rudy Japan. So we think there's a great scope for, for Rudy. So that's the one part of my talk. Uh, what I just want to touch on was the other group of patients, the one in the country. So if we get at one in 10,000, there's only one of these people in the whole country. What do you do with those people? Well, actually, no one else has ever seen anything like it before. Now, I've got the permission of this patient to share his x-rays, so he came in with leg pain in 2007, uh, and this is his x-ray. And actually, it's not too bad. There may be, for the, uh, for the medics, there's something wrong here. There's too much bone here. There's something growing here, and it just seems there's too much bone there. A year later, something fantastic has happened. He's now developed these little spikes of bone growing into his muscle. So he's starting to grow bone into his muscle, which is really odd. And he had premature heart disease, he developed multiple abscesses. Something very odd was happening. And then he came to us, and he's actually now managed to successfully completely lock his femur, and that he can't actually lift it more than this. Um, and it's growing. Actually, you can feel it. It's a lump in his groin, and it's a solid bone. So he came to me in clinic, and he said, look, 
I work as a delivery driver. Am I going to have to give up my job? Um, what can I do for the pain? Because it really hurts. I don't know what to do for it. And my kids, are they going to get this as well? Because no one knows what it is. Is it, is it heritable? So I said, I have no idea if you're going to give up your work, but I think it's highly likely at some point you'll have to retrain or look, look for other employment. For the pain, try painkillers. There's a surgeon at the back, but we thought from the experts, if you operate on this, it might make it worse. Um, and so we've said, look, try painkillers. We know they're not going to work. He's getting mechanical obstruction. He can't actually move his hip. Can I pass on to my kids? I don't know. And about five years ago, we would have just left it at that. That's what the NHS would have done with you. And then David Cameron, uh, as part of the, his sort of in, in initiative, set up something called GEL, which is a, a, a really complicated process, but behind the scenes is going to transform how you will interact with doctors in the next 10 to 20 years. And what it is, it provides free diagnostic testing for patients with rare diseases where the NHS cannot make a diagnosis. And it's a lot of money. It's 20 million. They have to spend it by the end of 2017. And there's a lot of people they're going to sequence. And basically, they decode your entire DNA code and find out how it works. Oxford's got the genomic center, so we can suck patients into Oxford and put them through this pathway. And I'm the national lead for the musculoskeletal research part of this program of work. And what does that mean, genomic clinical interpretation partnership? Nobody knew when they asked me to run it. If I knew what it meant, I wouldn't have run it. It's the most complicated structure I've ever come across. And it's run for free. We do this at our own time. It's trying to coordinate 91 academic members, 10 trainees across the NHS and academia. We have a core group, and we're supposed to come up with a diagnosis, come up with a questionnaires, apply for funding and training, but also organise this lot. And they're, they're amazingly talented physicians, but they're all in different parts. So uh, Melita Irving's in London, Michael, Mike Wright's in Newcastle, Mina's in Sheffield, Cyrus is in Chef, uh, Southampton, I'm here in Oxford, Daniel Perry's in Liverpool, uh, Professor Andrew Wilkie's here in Oxford. We've got analytics from Leicester, uh, genomics, uh, functional work from Oxford, radiology from, it's from all over the place. Jane Kay's there for the ethics. And basically what we're trying to do is coordinate genomic research. This is a really, it's not, it's about 700 pounds per test, but it raises loads of ethical issues. So if you look for a gene, you don't find it, but find the patient might have <coughs> breast cancer, do you tell the patient? How do you tell the patient? What are they going to do with the result? Loads of ethical issues, loads of training issues. How do you get doctors who don't, haven't even heard of genomics to start using it as part of their clinical practice? A lot of training and education to go through there. So in summary, I think Rudy works really well. It's a really efficient research process. Once patients are in, we can track them anywhere. If they go to Australia for s two years, it doesn't matter. We'll email them the questionnaires. They can fill them up on the beach <coughs> on Christmas Day if they want. It's a really nice way to pick up natural history and economics, and we can evaluate intervention. So if they come in on a new drug and put in the medication, we can then see what happens afterwards. It just seems a lot of excellence has coalesced in Oxford. We've now got a national web-based recruitment strategy, and we can collect data very easily at very low cost. We can change studies within uh, two weeks now. Future work, as I mentioned, one disease, like fibrous dysplasia, across Europe, across Asia. We're working very hard to do that with our partnership. But also one institution, like Asaka University, they're using Rudy across all diseases. Let's say if you've got a rare disease, just go to Rudy Japan, put all your data in, uh, and they'll take it from there. Because the overall aim is just to improve the clinical care of patients with rare disease of the skeleton and other sites. And I think we're getting there now. We're getting some nice information, getting nice patient numbers, and hopefully we'll soon be able to do it. But as with everything in life, there are knock-on effects. I hadn't heard of this. It's called TRPS. I had to look it up. Because Alison came to me and said, Kasim, these people have emailed us. And basically, they found us on Facebook. It's a very rare disorder. And we think all five patients with TRPS are now in Rudy in the UK. And actually, we, we don't have any researcher looking at it. So we're now working with the patients to write their own paper. They're going to look at their own data, and they're going to publish what they found in terms of quality of life. Because no there's no quality of life data. There's no pain data. There's no sleep data. 
So patients now can get involved and actually get in, recruit everyone else in there, and then write about themselves and really push it forward. And if you really want something inspirational, there's a guy called Mike Might in the States who's done it to such an extreme, he's now running his own trial for his child and is working with Obama on how to do rare disease research. As you can tell, I'm a really small spoke in a massive wheel. This is a really a collaborative uh, venture with the BRU, the Botner, the NIHR, University of Oxford and the BRC. Um, that's purposefully small. That just shows you how many academic members we have. And Alison at the back. This is the Rudy team. We're a really small team. And so Harriet only works a half a day a week with us, if that. David works with us even less. Joe works for me a day a week. Nathaniel on my other side works me full time. Alison half a day a week. And Joe's coming back from maternity leave soon. So it's a really small team to run this. People are surprised that we built all of this within six months and we did it. And it's really a credit to the team. And I'm happy to take any questions and find out to thank all the patients. Some of you here are in Rudy already. And I just want to thank you anonymously uh, to say for all your help. So happy to take any questions and thank you for your attention. <laughs>